Our next guest is Amina Chowdhury, who is live today from uh, uh, talking to us from Chicago. Uh, she's a documentarian. She's directed and produced cinematically sto uh, uh, stories driven by strong characters with personal and compelling struggles. These issues cover a broad range of personal and social political issues today. Her film, Tyrex Cube, won the Audience Award at the Globe Docs Film Festival and was broadcast at World Channel and PBS. She's co-directed a feature film, uh, Live Like Harris, which is a consideration for streaming and broadcast in the fall winter of 2020. She's in post-production of a short film to be released at World Channel and a feature film on the refugee crisis in Asia. She's also currently in production of an American-based documentary, which is expected to be released in 2022. Some of her other digital shorts include a first-person narratives with Olympic gold medalist Dahlia Mohammed, Hollywood actor Farhan Tahir, and others. In addition, she's working with a team developing a series of broadcasts on minority American stories that, set, uh, uh, that will be debuted in the fall. She holds an MA from Harvard University and a PhD from Boston University with a focus on ethnic and religious minority experiences in America. Amina, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, thank you for joining us. Um, it, you've got a very impressive uh, sort of background. It's interesting because I think when I meet a lot of young Muslim filmmakers, they seem to focus very heavily on improving, you know, how to edit and camera, and they're coming to it really from a very sort of technical background, whereas actually, it, it, you know, myself and many of the people who are trained, it was about stories and it was about journalism. How important do you think that journalistic um, aspect of making good content, in particular documentaries, is? And uh, how has it influenced you? Um, well, actually, I think it's really important. Um, you know, if you go back to the type of work that I do is very unscripted. So I'm sort of following subjects in their actual lives, um, you know, after being pre-vetted and, you know, discovering that this could be a potentially good story that could be told on film. Um, and so the work that I do is very unscripted in that way that I want to watch events as it unfolds, right? And so I think that's really the first angle in the journalistic sense. But when you're actually out there, um, you know, there are constant judgment calls that you have to make throughout the process of telling the story because you're engaging with not only the subject, but the subject's life as it happens and as it unfolds. Um, and so, you know, originally when we had this discussion, um, Naveen, we were talking about the audio aspect of it, right? And so I think that people don't realize that a lot of films and a lot of documentaries um, in some ways move because of the audio. And audio is really what drives a film forward, right? So you have your music that crescendos at a certain point, you know, that fades in, fades out. The choice of music, the dramatic choice of music, the, the moments that you have just complete silence. And when you're out in the field and you're filming, you know, in the process of actually putting together the story, it's also important to have good judgment and to know, well, when am I going to interact with the subject? And when am I just going to be a fly on the wall, right? And so there are times where we're filming and, you know, the subject is just sitting there in complete silence. And that's a judgment call that I have to make. Um, is this when I'm going to interact with the subject and maybe ask a question that can help pull the story out a little bit more or that gets, you know, his or her frame of mind in a particular moment so that when I go back and I make certain decisions in terms of how I'm going to cut a story or make it a documentary, that that moment could be very valuable. Um, and, you know, in an audio uh, context as well, a lot of people don't know this, but when we actually cut our documentaries, the very first thing we do is make transcripts of the entire, all the footage we have. And then we script just based on what is, you know, heard of, or, you know, what is heard in the process of filming. And we actually script the documentaries based off of that and then go into the visual and attach the visual. So, you know, I think that the journalism component is important in the work that I'm doing in the unscripted sense, because there's these judgment calls that you constantly have to make yeah. and you don't know what's going to happen or what's going to come in the future. But I have to know and I have to make a judgment. Where do I want this moment? You know, how do I want this moment to play into the story that I'm working towards telling? Mm. In the context of, uh, of Islam, as it were, in where you are, where you're living, where, where we are in, in, in the UK, um, how important is that documentary process in terms of actually just 
allowing people i mean one of the big things about why people claim that there's islamophobia is just a sense that the portrayal how have muslims been portrayal what are the classic tropes in which we're shown and uh, which 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 you know fundamentally you know the, the, you, we can go and find hundreds of documentaries on ramadan because that's what they'd be oh it's ramadan let's make a program about muslims you know and so actually the richness and the diversity that exists within the community actually it it, it 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 has to come out through this journalism i mean how aware are you that you're 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 carrying this responsibility as it were when you're making these films i mean very um first of all i i exist myself in this idea that every person has a story that's worth sharing right the question is can it be packaged in such a way that um, could be appealing to you know an audience, right? So I always go back to this, you know, as a Muslim woman, for example, in film, right? As a Muslim woman that's a director, I can see this in two different ways. One is women, for example, portrayed on film, you know, and we have this conversation about cuties and what had happened with Netflix this past week. Um, you know, so much of women are being, you know, hypersexualized in the Hollywood sense for so long. And what cuties, you know, shows us is that that age is actually moving to like less and less, you know, like there are now young girls as, you know, as old as 11 as appeared in cuties that are being hypersexualized. Um, this is important because we're recognizing that global media um, is heading in a direction that may speak less and less to traditional family values. So as a Muslim woman, I'm able to keep that in context and keep that in mind as I'm, you know, attempting to create a film. And, um, and then the second aspect- but then, but, then, but then at the same time, are you also perhaps hemmed in by some aspects of patriarchy and traditionalism in that context in our community where, you know, I mean, it's unorthodox to see Muslim, film, Muslim women filmmakers. Well, it's difficult not to see Muslim filmmakers, but then Muslim women filmmakers is an additional issue as it were. I mean, yes and no. I think that I'm always going to work against the grain because uh, there are so few of me that exist out there. At the same time, I think there are so many of us that exist out there that have yet to be discovered um, or yet to be given an opportunity to make a film, right? So as a Muslim woman director, am I? do I have access to more stories um, because I'm a Muslim and because I'm a woman? And I would say the answer is yes. And the reason is because you know, I'm already a marginalized voice in the director's seat, right? So any marginal vo voice you're going to bring in is going to have a richness to, you know, bringing in additional stories. Um, and I yeah. think that, you know, I mean, in, in this, this is what, what, what we, when we first met, we, we spoke about this because I, for a long time, I, I, I feel that there is a need to do um, perhaps a documentary on the life of Sayyidina in the Khadija, but wouldn't it be incredible just to hear it from the point of view of, an, an, an all female perspective as it were so even the narration the all the contributors everybody who makes it that actually it's it, it, it's just it just seems like the right thing to do actually it's not not a, a political act but it just seems like well that makes sense you know that to, to, to do that right of course because I am a Muslim woman and I have more relatability to the subject mm. you know him or herself um, depending on the context and in the case of a woman of course I mean Rabia al Adawiya, most of her biographers are men you know despite the fact that she's one of the most celebrated or one of the most quoted you know Muslim women from from Islamic history yeah. um, but then at the same time I think that this really goes into a deeper conversation about the art of story crafting right I mean my me as a Muslim woman am I important because I'm a Muslim woman I don't think so I think that my importance really comes from my ability and my skill set as a filmmaker and a story crafter do I have the ability to put to, you know, all of the elements that make a story move and make a story have certain, uh, certain you know, transformality or, uh, you know, uh, illumination, a chance to allow for the audience to have illumination? It, do I have that skill set, right? In this day and age, I think everybody is a filmmaker, everyone, because the technology is so accessible. Um, the, the question is, how many people can actually utilize judgment and the you know, ability to use the technology to move forward a story? Do you have the ability to frame correctly? Do you have the ability to get the right audio levels? Do you have the ability to you know, move, it, move a story in a certain direction? That's the first question. The second then comes to story crafting. And I think this goes back to the you know, previous panelists and, their, and the points that they were making. Storytelling is an intentional art, right? And I think that there's an intentionality in why stories have from the beginning of man, you know, uh, been a uh, product that has been used 
to drive forward a point or to create a certain element of connection. Um, and, you know, I read once recently that uh, there's this great, you know, idea that you can never exhaust uh, the actual meaning of a tale because there's so much connection that, you know, the person who is hearing the story or engaging with the story in whatever medium um, is able to take in and draw from that, right? It becomes sort of a nourishment um, that humans can relate to based on the needs of where they're at. So if you have the ability to tell a good story, I think that that's kind of the critical thing. And then the last stage, um, if I you know just slip this in real quick, I think the last stage of being a really good storyteller is every person who crafts a story is keeping in mind sort of the experience of the person that they want to hear their story. So I'm constantly making decisions. I mean, 120 hours of footage that I may have shot over like three years of a film is gonna dwindle down to 55 minutes or 35 minutes or 25 minutes or 10 minutes. I'm making decisions all the time. And in that process of making decisions, I'm also determining how do I want people to experience this story that I want to share. And you know, I think this is important because you know, every story has had a certain degree of, you know, creating that experience around it. You have in the Native American circles, you know, these storytelling sessions. Um, in different, you know, mosques around the world, you may have chanting or melody to go with storytelling yeah. because the story was designed that way. Well, well even, the even the of, prophets, even the Sarah, the te retelling of the Sarah. Yes, the, exactly, the exactly. And I think in the in the purpose of film, the the experience is to have an audience, right? That's that's the purpose of why you would have a film and choose to tell a story. You know, I've done stories in the print range, I've done stories in just audio, and I've moved to visuals, you know, for a number of reasons. I mean, one being that the world is kind of moving in that direction. But two, I think that there's so many ways that you can actually successfully tell a story on in the visual component and the visual aspect. And so in order for a, a film to have success, it needs to have an audience. And in order to have an audience, it needs to have a platform. Right. And, you know, my, uh, my unfortunate experience has been that it's extremely competitive in the market that we're in right now, right? On the one hand, because there are very few platforms that are well-respected and that have the ability, the technical ability to reach out to a number of, of more, you know, audience and to bring in people to watch the film. Um, and then in another aspect, as a Muslim woman, I'm making decisions on the stories that I choose to tell. Um, because, you know, again, I think everyone has a story worth sharing and even on film. Um, but the ones that I'm actually choosing to tell, they will come with a certain lens attached to it because I am the storyteller and I'm creating that intentionality and I'm creating that the experience of how I want it to be. And I have my set of values and my set of, you know, um, um, sort of direction that I want for a film to proceed in. So, you know, I think that um, the work that you're doing, Navid, is, is really critical because, you know, it's a very closed market right now, you know, and I think that the experience that I have had has made it very, very competitive and very, you know, difficult to get films well, in. So I, if I, you just have see, the ability I just see that there's a lot of talent in our community. There's a lot of creativity in our community. There's a lot of beauty in our community and no one's really paying attention to that. So, well, the community is just getting focused, you know, the, 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 the lens that's been focused onto the community has been one of the problems and the difficulties. And then actually now we've moved to the stage of the arrival of uh, YouTube. And that's, like you said, everyone's now a storyteller, but it, there has to be a distinction. I mean, we've started with Haroon, who it's kind of a combination of both uh, intermittent fasting and fine dining, what he was talking about, I'd see it. And then a video's content is, you know, really very good quality, hand reared beef and, you know, uh, organic food as it were. And then, yeah, you know, in terms of documentary making as well, it's it's sort of it nourishes the mind, it informs, it educates you. And then actually we've got the snacks, which is, you know, th the three minute on YouTube. And so actually this also translates into value. And the danger is when it's all equalized and that equalization is actually behind that is these big platforms they would put no they put no consideration on whether you spent 50 years crafting a masterpiece you know and may have spent so much of your life and money towards it or whether you've made it in in just kind of throw away rubbish as it were so they they just put everything on the platform and just let people consume and so i think for us it's really important that we're able to build our own independent space um, it's not going to be for every Muslim on the planet. It's not going to be for everybody's taste, but there is a growing consensus and a growing 
uh, a, a, you know, a, a community emerging who actually really value this. But also there is an interspace. There's an interspace between the inner workings of the Muslim community and basically mainstream society. And I think to inhab inhabit that space, it's quite important for us to actually at least mark that territory and say, hey, we, we're here, we have a voice and we, we're capable. We, 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 we understand the process, we understand the language, we understand the genres and we're able to do that. So and this thank is you actually, so, yeah. I was actually just add to that, this is actually why the Ertugal discussion is important, because if you're able to meet the production level and production value of what we're accustomed to, but then make it be something that is couched in Muslim terms that can be sort of accepted by more people, um, you're going to have an audience that's going to be drawn to that and actually very much so appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really appreciated you being here today and thank you for your contribution. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. My next guest, we're now off to Canada. It's so exciting, just jet setting around the world in the age of COVID, um, Saturday night for us here in London. Uh, it's Zarka Noir. She's a Canadian producer for film and television, a published author, a public speaker, a journalist, and a former broadcaster. In 2007, Zarka created the internationally renowned CBC comedy series, Little Mosque on the Prairie. It's the world's first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West. Little Mosque in the Prairie premiered to the highest rating CBC had in over 20 years. Internationally, Little Mosque has won awards for Best International Television Series, Best Screenplay at the 2007 Romeo Fiction Festival, and in 2012 it made its American debut on Hulu. And actually, we've still not seen it here in the UK. We've been trying to get this, and we, we, we don't have that here in the UK. So um, in 2014, her comedic... Uh, com comedic memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, appeared on the bestseller list of the Globe and the Mail. A frequent public speaker on Islam and comedy, Zoka received a Doctor of Divinity from the University of Saskatchewan, apologies to the Canadians, for her interfaith work in community. And importantly, she's a proud mother of four children. Zoka, Salam alaikum, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me on, Navi. Yeah. Four kids, wow. How do you find time to do all of that? <laughs> Fantastic. My, yeah, no, my husband helped uh, tremendously. And now now they're in their 20s, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> and so I have more time. Excellent. I mean, you're, you, you're one of the few Muslims who've just, you know, gone out there. You, you set a new standard, you broke through, um, and it became almost, I guess, a household name in every, uh, in Muslim conscious, as it were. People are so aware of what you achieved. Um, how, what drove you? I mean, what, how important was it to, for you to kind of get those stories out? Because you've also had a very similar trajectory of sort of journalism, documentary, and then into actually what is, um, you know, a popular, popular genre. It's kind of, you know, it's what television was made for, you know. I mean, I had a very similar trajectory to a lot of children of immigrants where their parents wanted them to go into medical school. And I even was in, you know, I was getting my science degree. I was planning on going to medical school. But once I got to the university stage, I could sense that there was something inside of me that needed to come out. I mean, what it was, was the storyteller part. And I just, you know, the physics and the organic chemistry and the calculus. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. There's, and I didn't know what it was, but I could feel it bubbling inside of me going, there's something else and I've got to explore it. And, you know, by the grace and mercy of God, I did not get into medical school. And it was those days when your parents couldn't ship you off to the Caribbean the way they do now. <laughs> there was, so if you didn't get in, that was the end. And, you know, you had to choose something else. And my mom was like, marriage, <laughs> I'll get you married. And I was like, no, no, there's something besides marriage. I want to get married eventually, but there has to be something besides medical school and marriage. There has to be a middle ground. And a friend of mine applied, was always talking to applying to journalism school and film. And those were the sexy careers, you know, that that didn't really apply to Muslim women. Like, you know, mm. we we're supposed to go into science and, you know, I just, just didn't just didn't compute. We did, there were no role models. And but I mean, I was, you know, I was in a desperate place. And I so I applied to journalism school and I got in and suddenly this whole world opened up of writing and story. And I was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. I, I didn't even know this existed because I had been so, you know, um, taken one track and one track only, which is science and medicine. And then I realized I should have gone to film school, but I didn't know the difference between film and journalism and writing. And, you know, cause there was this amorphous world. And so a friend said, make a film at the Ontario College of Art. It's just a three week summer film workshop. You can make a five minute film and then you can find out if you're a storyteller and you can become a filmmaker. So I, I did. And 
It was, and the Oklahoma bombing happened in 1990, I'm going to say 1995. And I thought, wow, this would be an interesting subject about Muslims because Muslims were arrested for that bombing until Timothy McVeigh was arrested like yes. three days yeah. later. Wow. You went from one suspect to the actual culprit, like the, 180 degrees. And I said, well, why is that? And that's when I realized that the power of stereotypes was so imbued in our culture that even law enforcement couldn't you know, see past it. And so I made a comedy called Barbecue Muslims where it, you know, it was two Muslim brothers who were sleeping one night, the barbecue blows up and they're accused of being Middle Eastern terrorists. And they're like, we didn't even wait. I mean, that's quite a brave move on such a, what, what probably is considered to be a very serious subject as it were. It was, but it got into the Toronto International Film Festival and they said yeah. to me, listen, man, this is like, there are technically beautiful films that did not get in because yeah. of yours. And the reason we're letting you in is because nobody is making comedies about Muslims and terrorism. We have never seen this before. <laughs> and they're, they're like, this is just too original for us to pass up. And that, that, that was, you know, their accepting that film opened up my whole life because once you get into a prestigious film festival like that, then, then that means funding bodies take you seriously. Then I was able to make my next film and my next film, and I was able to build on those experiences until I was able to make Little Mosque on the Prairie. Mm. And I mean, often many of us here who experience the sense of being the first brown face through the door or the first, you know, person to be in a particular industry but in your case I mean it's like coming from Mars with a headscarf and coming into into the world of filmmaking and seeing there how, what kind of reactions did you have I mean again I, I mean, think it was a shock you know, I think people were really surprised because it had never been done before and I think that helped me because when I pitched Little Mosque on the Prairie you know CBC said Muslims are in the zeitgeist we hear about you in the media and the news and you are the first person that has managed to capture that but in a comedy and then to make it into a mosque and, and, and about people who practice their faith and like you've, you've turned it into a story and it's relatable and it's universal. And, you know, the, the, the producer who's Italian and he's like, I relate to your stories because I come from Italian immigrants and Italian immigrants and Muslim immigrants. Like it, they're, it's a, these are universal themes and I completely relate to you. And that really surprised me because I thought, you know, nobody is kookier than Muslims. There's no story out there or a community out there that's kookier than the Muslim story in a mosque. But it wasn't true because... Muslims are human beings and have human experiences and every human experience is universal. So every pe people from all over the world who had different, you know, different points of view from different religions said, that is my community. And that surprised me, right? And that's how people bonded around the water cooler saying, that is about me and my mm -hmm. experiences. And that, and I thought, wow, I thought nobody could be wackier than us, but it, I was wrong. <laughs> I was totally proven wrong. And uh, tell us about your new project that you, you're getting ready for, as it were, Zarka. I, you know, every project I do is kind of inspired by something in the media that that, that I've latched onto. And I, and a few years ago, I was reading all these think pieces by um, by South Asian women after the Big Sick came out, after the film The Big Sick came out, after Aziz Ansari's Master of None. And they were saying, you know, why is it that brown? Like, finally, we get Muslims in Hollywood making it, but then it's about brown men having relationships with white women. And white women are sort of the, the, the trophy, the elevated trophy that brown men seek out and how it's a form of sort of internalized, you know, colonialism about how we have to have white centered films, even if they are about Muslim men and the Muslim experience and and how and if Muslim women happen to be in the film. And I acknowledge the big sick was um, a story about his life. But if you see how the South Asian women were portrayed in that movie, you know, it was very stereotypical or reductive stereotypes, accents. They were, you know, basically thrown under the bus. And whereas the white, cool lead, you know, Zoe Kazan was the one that he wanted and desired. And Muslim women were not the ones that were desired. And I thought that was so interesting that the critique about that film so I decided to make a satire like a, a romantic comedy where a Muslim woman you know her ex-husband leaves her for a skinny white yoga instructor because that's his trophy right and then she sees that on Facebook and she gets very vindictive and angry and she quickly types and says well you know what I'll meet you at your wedding with my uh, white uh, then she thinks to herself what would be the highest level that could match that brain surgeon <laughs> Brian she makes it up out of whole cloth presses send on Facebook and it's out right and now she has to find him so she goes on a you know dating app and puts in you know, her parameters of what she wants white brain surgeon named Brian and she gets a hit. And the comedy is how both brown Muslims are now saying, you know what, if we're going to compete with white trophies, I'll meet your white trophy with my white trophy. And we'll <laughs> see how that goes. And I wanted to, you know, make it very self-aware about how Hollywood makes romantic comedies and what it does to people of color. 
yeah. that I can play that game too. And the other thing I wanted to do was that we never see the Muslim experience beyond this thin sliver, like, you know, the, the terrorist Islamophobia, the you know immigrant parent and their child and their conflicts you know um there's there's like there are only this one percent of the stories that are told and i acknowledge they're real but the 99 percent of our stories and the 99 percent of what what we all go through is never there and i want to show a normal muslim woman who deals with issues like divorce by the way this is not true my husband is over there happily married <laughs> not leave me for a yoga instructor he just wants everyone to know that but my my goal is you know we need to get out of that that trap, these are dangerous stereotypes and just make stories about us being human who have human experiences that are outside of the normal Do you state. feel that, I mean, you know, when you look, when we look at people like Tyler Perry and this idea of taking control of that narrative and that there's, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why these tropes exist and why those narratives are there, but fundamentally people will argue that actually it's what sells, it's what people will come to watch, you know, there's, as, as a group, as a community, as a group of people, there's just not enough of us in, in these countries to justify um, the, 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 the budgets, as it were, to kind of do that. So do, are you, do you feel, having been in the industry for this period of time, do you, do, to you, is, is, is your work for that mainstream or do you feel that increasingly, like what we were talking earlier, that there needs to be an interspace between actually where we have more control of the narrative, we're able to say to people, look, this is not what you expect to see about us, but this is actually closer to what we do. And, but we're also not in what would be a very closed Muslim only narrative as it were. Well, I think Little Mosque broke open that space for a lot of people in Hollywood. They, for the first time they saw you could have non-white leads and mm. still have a white audience because white audiences don't want to just see white people. But if you don't create the product, then they have nothing to watch. And so, and I, I noticed that I got a lot of attention in Hollywood. And that after that, all these other shows started breaking out, like Fresh Off the Boats, you know, even Modern Family, um, you know, in Canada, Kim's Convenience. And, you know, studio executives said Little Mosque on the Prairie gave them the confidence to know that you can have diverse filmmaking and that there will be an audience. So it helps change the game. And now, you know, when all the critiques happened with, you know, BIPOC, um, people are saying, why are we not, you know, behind this camera? Why are we not allowed, you know, to be right in the writing room? Why are we not allowed to tell our stories from our perspective, from our viewpoint, not just white centered stories, and that you're just populating writing rooms, you know, for the sake of diversity quotients, because that's not what we need. We need mm -hmm. stories told from our perspective, our point of view. And so then, you know, so, so you saw, so you are seeing now Hollywood being taken to task for that. And now you're seeing them responding. And I think, you know, even when you see films now, like Crazy Rich Asians, where you have romantic leads who are both Asian. And so you're seeing the change. So the change is there and the opportunity is now because now they're waking up because now there's transparency and accountability and people are paying attention and counting the numbers and even going, you know, to, to streaming services and going, how many of these films are about white people and white centered stories? How many writing rooms do you have that have showrunners who are not white? Who, you know, and the gatekeepers are being told, why are you only letting, you know, white stories in? And so you're seeing that accountability. So now is a chance they are giving Muslims. And so we need more Muslims to rise up to this challenge and become the writers and the showrunners and own production companies and make the product that will go out to the mainstreamers. We can't, we can't be in our own little Muslim bubble making our Muslim shows just for our community because that doesn't help us in the world because the world has to see these stories and see our point of view so that they will, because, because television creates culture. And if we want to change the culture, then we have to change the television and what comes out of it. And that's our job, not just to be in our Muslim bubbles, but to be in the mainstream and to break out and to show the world. And we have the opportunity now because people are every I, I, I hear this every like decade. Now is the chance. Now there's chance. And it opens up a little wider and a little wider. But I feel like now there's a real, real opening and there's a real accountability that I haven't seen before. So I think if you're a filmmaker of color, this is the time to move as fast as you can. Thank you so much. It's been brilliant talking to you. Where can we find out more about um, your new project? So I have my trailer pinned on both my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram. And in the Canadian system, the, we, what, we have what we call discoverability. So the more people that share it, then the, then the Canadian government agencies say this is worth funding because she has proven that this is you know, a value and that people are watching. So what, I, what would help me is if people would share and retweet and put it on Facebook and Instagram and get it out there because that would help the trailer go from being a trailer to an actual television series. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today.